Thanks for joining us at Shannon's Club TV, the show for all motoring enthusiasts and Shannon's Club members. If this is your first time with Shannon's Club, join us in reliving some classic road and race memories as we celebrate this episode's feature car. We'll also get some market updates from the Shannon's auction team and take a road trip with a beautifully preserved example of our feature car. So, let's take a look at the model that was billed as the car of the century and almost turned out that way, the Austin 1800. The original BMC Zagonis team relied heavily on over-engineering their radically new Austin 1800 within the factory walls as a substitute for extensive real-world development beyond their British home base. The company's Australian arm was left to fill in the gaps for the 1800's local release a year after its 1964 British launch. When an Australian development engineer bottomed out the front suspension on an outback road, the sump hit the ground with such force that the British engine mounts sheared. This caused the entire drivetrain to slam into the firewall, severing the hydroelastic fluid suspension pipes and dropping the car into its bump stops. The damage list grew. The unattached powertrain then sheared coolant hoses, fractured the brake lines and exhaust system before damaging the body. It also exposed British wheels that were not strong enough. All from a chance encounter with what the 1800 would soon have to survive on a daily basis. It's unimaginable, Mark, that a car with this start in life could ever be a serious rally contender. Would it be fair to say that without the Australian rectification program, the 1800 could never have been a rally success? Absolutely. It's just incredible what the Australian BMC engineers had to do. They effectively took a production car and put it through an outback rally car development program. They Australianised the car. They raised the suspension. They put a sump guard on it. They made the wheels stronger. They improved the gear change. It just went on and on and on. What they ended up with was not only a great Australian family car, but also the basis for a brilliant rally car, particularly long distance events. They were also quickly applied to British cars as sales there had already begun to stall. In fact, Without Australian input and strong local sales that accounted for 40% of global production, the 1800 may not have survived for much longer. It was originally sold to Australians as the car of the century, 35 years before the 20th century ended. A wild claim at the time, it proved surprisingly accurate. Its transverse engine, its adaptive fluid suspension, large car comfort and space within a compact external envelope Long wheelbase, short overhangs, attention to safety and full list of standard equipment previewed 21st century priorities. The Austin 1800 demonstrated that the groundbreaking mini blueprint worked for family cars, not just runabouts. And now almost every car shares its layout. For Australians, the 1800 marks a high point after its replacement suffered from the lack of development funds under British Leyland. Local operations ended soon after. Mark, the 1800's Land Crab nickname came from the way it could be cornered at high speed on loose mm. surfaces. It must have been a force in rallying. It sure was, and if the uh, cards had fallen its way, it could have won what history now records as one of the world's greatest rally events. Coming up on the show, join us as we hit the road with a proud Austin 1800 enthusiast, and we get the latest auction news with Hammer Time. Without doubt, the most famous rally event tackled by the Austin 1800 was the 1968 London to Sydney Marathon, in which BMC works driver Paddy Hopkirk came within minutes of claiming what would have been the British car's greatest victory. Despite such a narrow loss, the fact that Hopkirk and his teammates were so competitive throughout the 16,000 kilometre marathon serves to highlight what a fantastic world-class competitor BMC had in the Austin 1800. Such a groundbreaking design for a family car, inspired by its smaller mini stablemate, also had the right ingredients for a long distance rally car. With the engine, gearbox and front wheel drive transmission all neatly housed at the front, the remaining 70% of the Austin's generous wheelbase was available for a three-man crew and internal storage of all spares and equipment. Combined with its remarkable fully independent floats on fluid suspension, front disc brakes and rack and pinion steering all packaged in an exceptionally strong body shell, the Austin 1800 possessed a rare ability to travel quickly over rough roads across vast distances with enviable comfort and durability. Joe, given its many attributes for long distance rallying, you know, it's no wonder this car was a game changer for family car buyers, particularly in Australia, where it proved so popular given our tough conditions. 
So beyond its groundbreaking design, what else made it such a standout? Well, the wild card in this 1800 was its engine. It was better known as the MGB power plant, mm. uh, where it had twin carburetors. It was detuned for the 1800, but even so, it had comparable power output to what people were used to from a Holton 6. Yeah. So it was a very good start. And what MG did not know about racing that engine, especially for long distance events like mm. Le Mans, mm. wasn't worth knowing. So they just simply transferred all of that knowledge all of that uh, development mm. and put it into the 1800 and when the body and all the other uh, components were sorted out it was just it was a reliable mm. endurance racer there, it just ended out that way yeah there was clearly some endurance breeding in the car the honorable sportsmanship shown by both hopkirk and teammate evan green in the london to sydney in stopping to assist other competitors in the final stages in australia ultimately cost both of them potential victories in their factory prepared austin 1800s Green, with his all-Australian crew of Jellignite Jack Murray and George Shepherd, was setting a cracking pace and looking ominously strong as the leaders headed toward the crucial final stages. But in a cruel twist of fate, the Aussies stopped to help another stranded competitor get back on the road, a rival by the name of Andrew Cowan, who in his Hillman Hunter would go on to win the event. Hopkirk, who after an early mishap had brilliantly fought his way back to second place, also threw away any chance of victory when he stopped to assist the leading Citroen crew after they collided with the spectator's car and were seriously injured with less than 200 kilometres to go. Even so, to finish only six minutes behind the winning Hillman after 16,000 kilometres of gruelling competition shows what an outstanding rally car the Austin 1800 was. And if not for the gallant actions of Hopkirk and Green, it could so easily have won the 1968 London to Sydney. If you're motoring enthusiasts like us, why not join the Shannons Club? Upload photos of your favourite cars, connect with other members and have access to exclusive club offers. You can read the full road and race histories of our feature cars and catch up on past episodes of Shannons Club TV on the club website. My name is Alexandra Collingwood and this is my car, it's a 1968 Austin 1800 Mark I. My name's Peter Collingwood and my car is a Mark II Austin 1800 uh, 1970 model. Just after I turned 17 I was, I was looking for a car that I would be able to drive once I got my P plates and my, my dad found out from an old friend that there was an Austin 1800 up for sale. It had been sitting in the Sky's backyard for about seven years, so there was a lot of work that had to be done. Even before I was able to drive, I had always thought that my first car should be a vintage car because I just feel like they have more character. Like, my car, its name is Charlotte, and you can't really name new cars. They don't really have the same character or the same history. My car's name is Nobby, um, and it's called that because the original plates that were on it were KNB, and uh, I wanted to make sure that it had the Y on the end because I know some people would have called it something else. They're great fun to drive. They hold the road really well, and they're rock-solid cars. They're so big and comfortable inside. Um, with my seat all the way back, there's still enough room in the back seat for someone to stretch out. They are cavernous. In terms of safety, obviously it doesn't come with anything like airbags or any of that kind of stuff, but Austins are built to be really solid. I think I was very lucky that my first car was able to be an Austin. It just turned out to be good luck that this one was, was being sold and I hope that I would get to keep this car for a, a very long time. I, I really want to look after it. Well, Shannon's National Auctions Manager, Chris Borobon, joins us. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hi, guys. Hi, Chris. Are we seeing much activity with Austin 1800s? Are people looking for them? Are they coming up for sale? What's going on? 
I've got to say through the Shannon showroom, we don't actually see any come through and I haven't seen any for a number of years. Uh, but, you know, there are the odd uh, 1800s advertised for sale privately. Uh, we've seen them in uh, various magazines over the years. And I think there's a you know, good club following for them also. So they probably tend to change hands privately. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, we're looking at three variations really, aren't we? The Mark I sedan, Mark II sedan, and then of course there's Mark I and Mark II utility. That's right, mm. yep. Any difference between those? And there's an automatic thrown in there as well. So what are we seeing? Where would you prioritise those? The ute's quite rare, so yeah. I think it's, you know, it's a point of interest. When you see that ute, you think, wow, it's something a bit different. Well, it's quite unique to Australia. Yeah, it's right. the only front drive ute that we built here, I think. Yeah. Mm. And would you find a, a Austin 1800 with a, a competition background of more value than just a road car? Again, that's probably not known to a lot of people, mm. so we really haven't seen it. I think we've seen a customer come in with a replica of the uh, one yeah. of the works cars, and it looked quite great, uh, quite good in the in the red with the uh, white roof. Mm. Good looking car, yeah. So, what advice would you give to someone who's interested in buying an Austin eighteen hundred? Look, I think if they're looking for a, a good Austin eighteen hundred, uh, they should keep an eye out on the classifieds, uh, also online, and potentially join the club or mm. inquire through the club, and uh, they'll probably find a nice car. So this is a real opportunity for, this is one car where you can get in on the ground floor and we're seeing some momentum growing around the 1800. Is that a fair comment? I'd say so. It is very affordable to get mm. into the Austin 1800 ownership. And if you, you know, it's a car that you can take your family or friends out. It's roomy enough. So yeah, it's not a bad car to start off with. Well, thanks for joining us, Chris, on Hammer Time. Keep in mind, you can keep up to date with all the latest Shannon's auctions news on the Shannon's Club website. For a lasting memory of the Austin 1800 in competition, or the other cars featured on the show, you'll find them all available in Autopic's incredible archive of more than 760,000 motorsport images. I guess in wrapping up the Austin 1800, Joe, you look at that blueprint that it laid down, the four-cylinder transverse engine, front-wheel drive, that's become like a blueprint for most modern cars. Well, if you look at the biggest selling cars in this country at the mm. moment, and it Started off as that 1.8 litre, 2 litre, transverse engine, big passenger area, mm. and, a, and short overhangs, long wheelbase, it's all there. They're finding new ways of making those engines more efficient by making them smaller and turbocharged, but the 1800 was that starting point. Mm. And it was interesting that um, BMC, when they put these cars out that were totally different from anything else you could buy at the time, they went for the educated buyer. They, mm. they heavily advertised in magazines, specialist publications, looking for that person who could see in the future. Look what's happened. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? A real groundbreaker, the Austin 1800. Well, thanks for joining us for this rather dusty trip down memory lane. We look forward to your company next time on Shannon's Club TV.